uh, OP and the University of York. Um, these sessions um, in this colloquium series are here to explore uh, the various sort of new strategies of pushbacks, participations, and resistance in the context of rising authoritarianism, populism, and democratic back backsliding that we observe in several parts of the world. Um, our speakers today are Tatiana Vargas Maya, who uh, is an assistant professor of international relations at the Department of Economics and International Relations at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, in Brazil. She also trained here as a BA history and an MA international relations student. She holds a PhD in political science from Southern Illinois University in the US. Uh, and she has published extensively on democracy, nationalism, and the emergence of the new right. Uh, our, our second speaker is Amog Dhar Sharma, um, who is a departmental lecturer at the Oxford Department of International Development, University of Oxford. Uh, he has previously held an ESRC postdoctoral uh, fellowship and has worked <clears throat> as a lecturer in uh, modern South Asian studies here at Oxford. His research interests include uh, comparative politics, political communication, and political economy of development in South Asia. And he's published on professionalization in the realm of party and electoral politics in South Asia. Due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, Rosanna, Hosanna, uh, who is an anthropologist from the University College Dublin was not able to join us. Uh, hopefully we can have her in a future event in uh, the series. So um, the format is going to be um, sort of conversational. We are hoping to do sort of get um, thoughts of both our speakers on certain themes that um, sort of are overlapping and are of interest to the, um, to the colloquium series. So to just sort of start off, um, if I could begin with um, Tatiana, and um, <clears throat> how can I not begin with the recently conducted uh, elections in Brazil? Brazil is at a, a turning point. Um, so in the context of the elections in Brazil, I wanted to ask you, what is the nature of support for uh, Bolsonaro, particularly among um, disadvantaged communities, among the poor and among the youth, which, which are the sections that sort of continue to support um, Bolsonaro. Thank you, Ankita. It's a pleasure to be here. I was very happy to be invited to participate in such an exciting colloquium series, uh, especially in this moment in Brazilian politics, uh, in which a lot of the issues we all study and are concerned with seem to be in a height, in a high point. So it's, it's very good to be here and to be able to talk to colleagues about these things. And maybe even hear about you, how, how you are perceiving Brazilian politics right now. Um, you mentioned that Professor Pinheiro Machado won't be able to be here today because of unforeseen circumstances. But I've been talking to her, as you know, we've been editing a volume on the rise of the radical right uh, in Brazil. Amog and Indrajit also participate as authors in this volume. And a lot of the comments I'm going to make here today are, are based on this research and this discussion we've been developing together for the past two years. Um, re regarding your specific question, it's interesting to think, especially in the light of the recent polls that have uh, uh, came out just yesterday, actually, regarding the second turn of the Brazilian presidential elections, to think about the support that Jair Bolsonaro has among the poor and the disenfranchised in Brazil. If we take this in a short historical perspective, there is somewhat of a puzzle that a lot of anthropologists and social scientists have been highlighting, which is a lot of the population or at least uh, parts of the population that have been benefited by the social policies implemented by Lula and President Dilma, who self governments. And we're talking about uh, Bolsa Familia, which is all the social programs supporting kids going to school, but also giving families money to support that kids won't have to work and they have time to go to school. And a, an extensive network of social programs. Most of these subjects have turned and voted for Bolsonaro in 2019. Uh, and it's somewhat of a puzzle. What happens that when you have some kind of inclusion in Brazil, which is historically a very recent phenomenon, that this electoral, uh, that this, these people would turn against 
the leaders who promoted these changes. Um, this has been the subject of intense debate for the last four years in Brazil, mostly because a lot of us didn't see it coming. Uh, it seemed that Brazil had consolidated into some kind of a social democracy and that we had finally established or reached some kind of uh, stable political horizon in the country. Well, 2018 proved that that was not the case, mostly because of the somewhat surprising election of Jair Bolsonaro, which was not in any sense an expressive politi politician in the country. He had been uh, a congressman for more than 20 years, but he was very much uh, opaque in his presence in the country. What a lot of people have been telling us, uh, and Professor Pinheiro Machado research on this since 2013 has been pointing towards that, is especially about a specific, the brewing of a specific resentment among the poorer classes on what would have been promises that were not fulfilled. That even though the country saw an enormous progress regarding our social metrics, those metrics don't actually reflect on the stability and the quality of life of the poorer classes. And therefore, they saw in the campaign of an anti-systemic candidate such as Jair Bolsonaro, a way out, uh, or at least a shorter way to fulfill those promises. I don't think we should forget, of course, uh, the role of our ruling classes and our economic elites in this process, right? Because it's not only about the disenfranchised, but it's also about the resentment of historically established elites in the country who didn't quite like the democratization the country was going through. And this was not only in economic terms, that is of the granting of access to the poorer classes, to social services and institutions, such as universities and education, but also uh, an identity, um, let's say um, a, a transversal identity issue, which is the claiming of citizenship by ethnically minority groups, such as African Brazilians, such as the indigenous populations, but also LGBTQ rights and the feminist movement. So there is, I always see and I tell my students that there is this, this, this effervescent movement in Brazil in the, the last 20 years, which is very interesting for us as social scientists, but it's very anxious. It's a very anxious moment of our politics because we've been seen since the democratization, which happened in 1988, and a larger movement and a strong movement of inclusion be it for, through class uh, issues, be it through identity and other types of, of, uh, of marginalized politics. But we have seen also a very strong reaction from our ruling classes to stop that movement. Uh, and, to, and I think at least that's my interpretation to, to keep Brazilian democracy in very institutional terms, right? In the, procedures in the electoral procedures and maybe in our institutions, but not actually in the development of our, in expansion of our citizenship rights. Uh, the polls that came out yesterday seem to denotate a, an interesting change, which is poor classes right now are supporting Lula, right? We saw that change. So again, in, uh, in the period of four years, we have a very strong change of these disenfranchised classes, realizing that the promises Bolsonaro made in 2018 and 2019 were not fulfilled. And so they're coming back around to Lula. The problem, and I was talking to Rosanna just yesterday about this, is that most of these people are not able to vote because they are far from their election sites. They don't have the time to stop working to go and vote. And so we're seeing an interesting change in the way the polls are painting the picture for, for the end of October, which is Lula seems to be ahead among the poorer classes and the disenfranchised, but there is a very high abstinence from the, from the voting sections. And that's what most uh, experts say 
is bringing Bolsonaro dangerously close to Lula again. I don't know if I answered your questions. I myself am thinking about this right now, and it's kind of... Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, um, and 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 what is the role uh, given uh, uh, with reference to your work on nationalism? What is the role that ideology sort of plays in uh, in in creation of in in bringing Bolsonaro and and has that have you seen that sort of undergo any changes in the last uh, couple of years? I don't think there was a time in Brazilian history in which our political parties were not nationalist, but we do see a very um, strong presence in the last, year, the last years of nationalistic rhetoric among right-wing parties. But it has changed in a sense. For instance, during the di dictatorship, which ran from 1964 to 1988, it was a very strong classic case of nationalism. We even had the slogans like Brazil, love it or live it, right? Right now, uh, I would say we're seeing the emergence of uh, a religious kind of nationalism in Brazil. Uh, and in that, I would even like to hear from you uh, and from Amal perhaps, because I, I don't know much about the case of India and of Hindu nationalism, but from what I've read, there seems to be interesting parallels in these cases. But in the case of Brazil, it's not Catholic nationalism as one would expect from the history of the country, but it's, it emerges from the neo-Pentecostal and neo-charismatic movement. So the neo-evangelical churches that are, again, to, to link to your previous questions, very, very present on the, the favelas and the shanty towns in Brazil. And they are very strong, especially among the Brazilian poor. And uh, there is this very um, religious, evangelical rhetoric associated to Brazilian nationalism nowadays that plays strongly on gender roles and plays very strongly on a discourse of destiny and determination and of Brazilian, Brazil somehow being uh, a Christian country and having to fulfill a destiny as such. One of the interesting changes that I've seen observed in this election cycle, and that I haven't read anyone talking about it because it's very recent, is that before we would listen to this rhetoric of a Christian nationalism in Brazil or the relevance of Christian values to the composition of our political scenario, but most people wouldn't differentiate between the Catholic faith and the evangelical faith, the new Pentecostal. Now there is a very strong divide. So on October 12, it's the, um, the patron saint of Brazil. It's the day in which the country celebrates its patron saint, which is a Catholic saint. Um, it's Our Lady of, I don't know, I don't know how I'll translate that, but it's one of the many Our Ladies we have. Um, and it's usually marked by a big celebration in a city in the countryside of São Paulo, Aparecida. And uh, for the first time that I've read of or heard of, there was a big divide. Evangelical and neo-Pentecostal militants went to the celebration drinking beer, which is completely out of grounds, and screaming at the priest who was holding the celebration. So this is new. There is a strong divide uh, among, the, among, both, among Brazilian Christians. And now the Catholics are somehow aligning themselves with the more progressive politics. And that's an interesting return to what, to what the Catholic Church used to do during the dictatorship. So land rights, the disenfranchised, uh, a return to the theology of libertation. And the evangelicals are siding with the new right and the conservative movement in Brazil. But that from my observation, is the strongest expression of Brazilian nationalism today, at least as we identify a nationalist discourse, right? In terms of belonging and who is Brazilian and what is the right way to be a Brazilian. To um, uh, bring in a move into this conversation, uh, uh, we're talking about the rise of a certain kind of nationalism 
um, uh, in Brazil, we are obviously aware of sort of similarities in the in the rise of uh, Hindu nationalist rhetoric um, in India. Um, how, um, given your work in looking at the sort of the cyber public sphere, um, how do notions of authoritarianism and um, nationalism sort of play themselves out uh, in that domain? Right. Um, firstly, thank you for the warm introduction, Ankita, and thank you for Shagnik. Thank you to Shagnik and Nidijit and Melissa and the whole team, which has pulled this wonderful series together. Um, you know, just following up from what Tatiana said, um, a few weeks back, I was on another panel where my co-speaker was uh, Professor David Neymar, who of course works on WhatsApp-based disinformation in Brazil. And it's all, I'm always struck by the number of parallels which emerge and how WhatsApp in particular is being used by right-wing leaders in both India and Brazil. I mean, the, the parallels are just staggering, both the, the, not just the messages that they put out, but also the techniques and human infrastructure that goes behind spreading a lot of this. Um, and on that point, I think you know it's also worth emphasizing, Rosanna, who couldn't be here with us um, today, uh, tweeted about this a few days back, where she took, took exception to the fact that Bolsonaro was being called Trump of the tropics. And Rosanna's point was the fact that, you know, Bolsonaro can't just simply be reduced to be a pale imitation of something that's happening in the Western world. And I might sound like a broken record, and I've said this many times in the past, whether it's Modi, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, these are leaders which have emerged and their right-wing populism has emerged much before Trump, much before Brexit, right? The, the, this, the, the, all of this was already in the shadows. Uh, so we can, we, I think we need to stop talking about the first in the West, then in the rest sort of rhetoric. We need to take the seriousness with which this has emerged in the global South, first and foremost. Um, coming to the question that you shared, um, you know, not to make this autobiographical, but I thought I could just start by talking about how I got really interested in looking at nationalism and, and authoritarianism on the cyberspace. So of course, you know, I started my graduate research around 2013, and this was a period when Arab Spring was still very much in the air. A decade later, of course, we can laugh at a lot of the things we thought about what Arab Spring represented, but back then, of course, this was a period which was a big movement for techno-utopianists everywhere who saw all sorts of democratic possibilities within social media. And, you know, the hubris of a young graduate student was the fact that I want to somehow, you know, also engage in this debate. And what I was seeing that, you know, within academia, when people were thinking about democracy and social media, they were talking about how internet solves the problem of collective action and free riding, classical political and science tropes. All of, our, all of which are important questions within the social movement environment. Uh, but my own approach when I started to operationalize this project in India was to move away from the question of regime transitions, you know, whether internet can somehow shift from an authoritarian regime to a democracy. And the question that I got interested in was within existing democracies, how is social media impacting political subjectivities, political culture, you know, these shared social imaginaries which are at the heart of democracies. And there, of course, you know, when I did field work starting from the 2014 general election, uh, I studied BJP's infrastructure of social media and the wider outfits within the Sangh Parivar, which is the organization linked to the Hindu nationalist movement. Um, and what I saw was that simply by changing at the scale at which we, which we were studying the impact of social media, it was more than clear that it was lending itself to majoritarian impulses, not the promise that was coming out of the Arab Spring. And this is because there was something very fundamental about the affordances of the medium. There was something in the way it was coded in certain formats that lent itself to a majority of ethos. Because social media, as we know, is a platform where your success and visibility is tied to the number of likes, followers, retweets, uh, all of these things which incentivize a certain way of behaving that dovetails with authoritarian populism. And so it should not come as a surprise, uh, knowing what we know and you know, uh, hindsight is almost 2020. But this was very clear in 2014, uh, anyone you know, who's doing field work, and there were many others like me who were looking at this question around that time. One thing that I have since tried to consider is that, you know, irrespective of what happened in 2014, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. One of the questions I've been thinking about more recently is that why does the right wing um, nationalist and authoritarians benefit so much more from cyber propaganda than their left wing counterparts, or even their centrist counterparts for that matter? Uh, at an empirical level, we know that it's not as if right-wing right -wing parties have a monopoly over the technology. This technology is freely available to everyone. So why is it that they are not benefiting as much? And you know, this is, I can only give a flavor of my answer, which is still work in progress, but this is something I'm working towards in the book that Rosanna and Tatiana have edited. This is what my chapter delves on. 
And firstly, I think it's worth pointing out that by now we have enough evidence to show that right-wing parties, at least in India, have an undoubtable advantage. And here, if you give me a chance, I want to amplify certain voices who are doing wonderful research and journalistic reportage on this. So, you know, we have Mehindu uh, Kulasurya who writes in the print, and she has this wonderful story which showed uh, that compared to the BJP, which has something close to 18,000 Twitter accounts which spread fake news for the party, Congress had 147. So that's 18,000 compared to 147. That's the methodology she uses to come up with it. There's Pooja Chaudhary, who does wonderful work for Alt News, who has shown that BJP ministers and you know someone like Amit Malviya systematically spread misleading news stories. It's not a one-off occurrence. There's a pattern there that one, one, one can detect. And there's, of course, an article which came out earlier this year by Akbar Panda and Pal. I think the journal was uh, Journal of South Asian History and Culture, which again shows that BJP has an edge in India, right? So let's not let's not make have be in any doubts about the fact that the right wing has an advantage. At one level, it's important and it's quite uh, easy to understand what are the affinities between new media technology and right-wing populism. On the one hand, media lends itself to a sort of charismatic demagoguery, which right-wing authoritarian populists love, right? That's, that's easy for us to see. On the other hand, we can also see that media technology allows for the easy spread of conspiracy theories and xenophobia quickly, anonymously, which again dovetails with what has traditionally provided strength to right-wing politics. But my answer is that there's a third reason that we often miss, which is the fact that right-wing parties benefit from the use of digital propaganda because they're able to hide the organizational strategies through which they spread it. And the point that I want to suggest, and we can open this up for discussion, is that what distinguishes the way left-wing parties and right-wing parties use digital media is that the left never hides the organizational basis that goes into spreading their propaganda. We know, for instance, the left has, of course, historically been enamored with the idea of the vanguard party, which raises everyone's class consciousness, which, of course, organizes people in a certain way and makes them see the light, makes them see the argument. Hence, they don't hesitate from showing the fact that they're doing the organizing. Whereas what right piggybacks on is by showing that they're not converting anyone's mind, they're not proselytizing anyone, but they're representing sentiments which already lie in society. Hence, the, the way they go about spreading uh, fake news, disinformation, whatever term you want to use, use uh, for it, the way they do it is to hide their own footprints, to hide the manpower, sorry, the human power, I stand corrected, and to hide the ideological and the physical infrastructure through this, through which rumors and conspiracy theories are spread. Hence, it starts appearing every day, quotidian, and it starts appearing as common sense, as the ideological common sense of society. And I do think this is a point that we need to think about a bit more. Uh, whether it's Brazil or whether it's in India, you know, Tatiana can tell me a bit more about whether this is this has resonance in the case of Brazil. But I do think the fact that as scholars we need to think more about that: how can we uncover the organizational basis through which the right spreads this? And I think the hope for tackling a lot of this lies in uncovering the infrastructure through which this is perpetrated. Um, Tatiana, since Amog brought this uh, up, I, I'm curious, Lula's online campaign, uh, because we have an in instance of a, a, a right and the left sort of uh, pitted against one another, Lula's online uh, campaign would, would be an example of the pattern that Amos observed or an exception to that pattern? I, I really like to hear uh, Amog's argument, but I, because I do think it applies, I think you have a very strong point at least regarding our experience with this last electoral cycle in Brazil. It is very interesting, and I'll get to Lula in a minute, Ankita. I just wanted to, because I was thinking about Bolsonaro's campaign uh, on the light of Amog's uh, commentary. And uh, I do think it's very, there is a very strong sense of spontaneity that the new right communicates in their online presence. And that does not correspond to their actual organization. They are very well organized and structured, and they have very strong channels of funding, which allows them to, to have all this presence. But when you analyze what appears to, to, to the audience, it is very ingenuous in a sense. It seems disorganized, it seems spontaneous. Bolsonaro has, uh, has explored that a lot. On, uh, on trying to, to, to emphasize on how he is a common guy, right? Who is just trying to do 
politics in the way common people would do politics. And that's the populist verb that runs uh, behind his campaign. But on their online presence, it's exactly that. It communicates as common sense. And the interesting thing in Brazil, at least following, and I'm not a scholar of, of, of social networks or even political communication, so this is more of a spontaneous observation on my part, but we see that uh, left-wing influencers, which are trying to support Lula's campaign, have been tackling these issues. And they have been trying to understand what are they doing wrong, that they cannot have the adherence on common sense discourse that right-wing influencers do. And uh, some of the discussion is that they are too scholarly, that they're always trying to teach people how to do politics, while right-wing influencers are simply doing politics. I think, and I'm very curious actually for Hosanna's new line of research, because I think she will explore more of that, but talking to her and her uh, new observations, she says that, and she just published a piece on Brazilian media, media today about this, that most of the influencers on Instagram, which is the largest social network in Brazil right now for politics, are siding with Bolsonaro, but they are also siding with this entrepreneurship rhetoric of success and the self-made man and of working yourself to be better and therefore to follow success while influencers on the left are, seem very much lost in trying to present serious academic discussions such as class differences and gender differences and racial inequalities to the public, and that they lose the public somehow. Um, returning to your answer to your question, Ankita, regarding uh, Lula's campaign, I think Lula did a very beautiful campaign this turn. Uh, I think he tried to explore some of the best things that we do have in the political horizon in Brazil, and he presented a very inclusive campaign and a very positive message in this sense, trying to, I think, distance himself from the image he had from the 80s and the 90s of being a very combative leftist, right, and presenting himself of more of someone who wants to make Brazil work again and overcome our differences, which have been so stark for the last four years. However, in terms of engagement in social media, it, it's very little. Uh, yesterday, no, the day before, yes, the night before yesterday, he went to one of the largest podcasts in Brazil, which is called Flow. And uh, it seems that he had the highest audience of any podcast in the country forever. So that's a good sign. But somehow, at least in my observation, his campaign does not engage in, with the same intensity as Bolsonaro campaigns engage. And then I think Amog has a very good point that I would like to hear and, uh, and read more about this which is tactics of communications and what is being communicated and how it is being communicated. The impression I have is that Lula's campaign is always very wordy in a sense and very professoral and that doesn't work well with social media in a whole. Uh, Ankita, if I could just quickly come in there, if that's possible. I really like the word that I think Tatiana used, spontaneity. I think, you know, that I was struggling for that word. And I think that's, that captures and goes at the heart of what I was trying to say. That, you know, it's not so much the message, the content of the rumor or conspiracy theory you're spreading. Because if you think about it, Hindu nationalists and have stuck to the same conspiracy theories for a really long time. You know, a few days back, I was, uh, I was rereading Francine Frankel's India's Political Economy. And she has this lovely footnote from a discussion in the 60s, 50s or 60s, that uh, at that time, Jansang, which was the forerunner party of the BJP, it was spreading a rumor that the newly constructed Ashoka Hotel in Delhi had been constructed so that beef-based dishes could be prepared for Nehru himself, personally. This is a rumor that they were spreading during a general election campaign in the 50s and 60s. And you can imagine that it's not changed much, right, uh, half a century later. So again, goes to the show that it's not so much the content which keeps changing, which are the, they're so adept at packaging, because you, know, you can hire the best political consultants and spin doctors. All parties can do that. 
but it's really about paying attention to how do you make it seem like the ideological common sense and appear spontaneous, which then has a snowball effect. I think that's what I was going at, and I must thank Tatiana for the vocabulary, which I need to use more carefully. Um, the, no matter, uh, Tatiana, no matter what the outcome of the uh, uh, Brazilian um, elections, um, would I be right to think that a little bit like uh, the US, the society is sort of deeply divided based on the, the percentages of uh, uh, what each of them got, it really sounds like it's sort of split, split uh, in the center. Is there, um, is there a sense of a sharply divided uh, community and, and palpable tension between uh, uh, communities on the ground? Yes, you are absolutely correct, Ankita. And uh, part of the discussion we've been having in Brazil is that even if Bolsonaro is not re-elected president, uh, Bolsonarismo, Bolsonarism, is here to stay. And uh, we'll have at least two decades of a legacy to deal with it, thinking on electoral cycles. Uh, one of the, the evidence that we already have is that on the beginning of the month, the first round of elections, uh, we also had elections for our Senate, a third of our Senate seats, and our Congress. And uh, most of Bolsonaro's former ministers, for instance, uh, his minister, Damaris, uh, his minister of women issues, and family and human rights, um, his environment, his former environmental minister, all of these guys who participated in the first moment of Bolsonaro's campaign, 2018, 2019, up to the beginning of 2020, were elected to Senate or to the Congress seats. So there is a clear sense of a victory, even though, and that's what, I think contaminates a bit of our optimism or our possibility to be optimistic is that we know they're here to stay. Uh, Bolsonaro's sons were all re-elected. Those who were considering re-election were all re-elected. Um, so even if Lula wins, he's in for a tough term. Some analysts don't think that Lula will be able to finish his first mandate uh, because of this instability and this divide. And even Sergio Moro, which used to be, first of all, the judge that imprisoned Lula in the first place through uh, that corrupt process, but also was the minister of justice for Bolsonaro, was elected to the Senate. So there is a, Bolsonarism has taken roots in Brazil. And uh, this, this, this division is very palpable. Uh, more so it was on the grounds, right? Not only on the, the chambers. This is the election, from what I remember at least, which we had the, the highest incidence of political violence in post and during the campaign, with several militants being murdered uh, during the campaign because of this kind of disagreement. So we had an episode, I don't know if it circulated abroad, but in which a cop, a policeman, who was siding with Lula, was celebrating his birthday with a PT, a labor a workers' party team for his birthday. And his birthday was invaded by a militant from Bolsonaro's team, and he just opened fire against everyone. And there was this discussion if it was a politically motivated crime. Uh, most people who were witness to the crime say that there is no doubt because the man barged in screaming against Lula and the workers' party and corruption and the, all the moral issues. But even this has been questioned by the campaigns, that it was just a, a spur of the moment issue and not a politically motivated, which is an attempt to, 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 to withdraw the seriousness of the situation. So yes, there is a very, very uh, Brazilian society right now is very tense. Uh, this has even contaminated uh, people during the election day most people saying that they would not wear red or stars, which would associate to, to the workers' party, right, to PT, to go vote, because they were afraid of being victims of political violence during the election day. So this is here to stay. We'll have to deal with it. Even if Bolsonaro is no longer president, even if, as Lula has promised, 
we, we are able to pursue Bolsonaro for his crimes during his mandates. After he loses the election, uh, Brazilian society is very much divided and uh, Bolsonarism will, will stay with us. It's a, it's a heritage, a political heritage we'll have to deal with, unfortunately. Um, I had uh, thought that I would ask um, Rosanna this, but uh, in case you have sort of, uh, I was wondering about the diaspora. I was going to ask her about, uh, you know, the sort of Brazilian diaspora uh, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, is there a particular, is, are they powering one side or the other? Or do you think that the same kind of sort of division is also reflected in the diasporic communities? Interestingly enough, uh, the diasporic, the Brazilian diaspora has a sort of geographical preferences according to ideological lines. So for instance, uh, we had for the first time very strong, um, a very strong presence for voting abroad in the Brazilian embassies all over the world. So Tokyo, all the capitals in Europe, uh, the UK, the United States, what does those uh, election results tell us? That for instance, in Europe, most of the Brazilian diaspora is at least aligned with center left politics, right? So it's not only Lula, but also the other, the other center candidates such as Ciro Gomes, Simone Tebet, and so on. In the United States, it's just Bolsonaro. Miami, it's amazing. Uh, and they even have protests, right? Whenever we do have manifestations from the Bolsonaro camp in Brazil, people in Miami also organize and go to the streets, which give us the most surreal and interesting images of this bunch of Brazilians protesting against the government in the United States or pro-government in the United States. So it is divided, but we do have this regional this geographic distribution in a sense of most Bolsonaristas going to the United States and Brazilians in the left uh, focusing on Europe. I don't know if there is any reasonable explanation for that, besides the point that for a long time, the United States and Miami was, an, was thought of as an easy way out of Brazil in the sense of people that didn't want to deal with uh, the underdevelopment of the country and the, its consequences for public security would easily go to Miami. And I think it has to do also with the presence of Spanish speaking populations in Miami, which bring people closer to Portuguese, right? So it's easier to communicate and to situate yourself rather than having to deal with, with English. Um, maybe it's that. There is this, this constant rhetoric of Brazilian conservatives going to Miami to escape the country. Um, but that's the concentration we see. Right. Um, and and Amog, if I could bring you in uh, to this conversation, in your observation, how, how dominant is uh, sort of domestic uh, politics uh, in India? How, how does it reflect itself in the, in the diaspora? <coughs> Um, you know, that's a tricky question and also such an interesting moment to be asking that, you know, I've been thinking about Liz Truss resigning and God knows if Rishi Sunak, you know, Dishi Rishi is going to run. I know last time around when the leadership contest was happening in the Conservative Party, the Indian media, of course, had a field day and they were talking about very passionately that, you know, an Indian origin person should be should be at the helm of affairs and who knows, you know, where that will go. Um, and, you know, of course, on the other side, Keir Starmer recently used the term Hindu phobia when he was responding to um, concerns about the skirmishes that took place in Leicester. So, and he got a lot of flack for that. So there is definitely a sense in which both parties here think there's a lot at stake in the diaspora, which exists in South Asia and what they might feel about, you know, things going back home and trying to pull them one way or another. There is that. And I think that's also worth saying there's a lot of uh, important social groups and civil society groups in the UK who do take active stands about what's ha what happens uh, back in South Asia. Um, and that's important, I want to acknowledge their work. But on the whole, if I'm being honest, I don't think the diaspora plays a massive role in the pushback against democratic backsliding in India. And I don't see that they take uh, any concerted stand which might make it a tipping point one way or another. And maybe let's think a bit more about why that might be the case. 
the first issue is, I think, you know, in line in light of what happened in Leicester, where we had these, you know, Hindu and Muslim mobs, groups, what word can I use, uh, fighting against one another. The trend that seems to be emerging is that divisions which exist in South Asia are now being trying to be replicated rather than the other way around. So that for me is quite a disturbing development that I think many other people are also concerned about. That doesn't give me much hope. But to understand how something like Leicester could happen, I think we need to acknowledge that this has been a long time in the making. In early 2019, uh, you know, I was thinking that there were a lot of news stories which came up in the British media, which said that large number of second and third generation British Indians who were living in the UK, uh, we're going back to India to help out in the campaign in the general election in India, which was happening in the summer of 2019. And initially, you know, I did not believe it. I thought this was just one of those clickbaity news stories that someone had written without really fully understanding what's at stake in Indian politics. But I, I, I did two months of field work right before the general election as I was winding up my PhD. And I actually saw for myself that when I did interviews in the campaign teams of both the Congress and BJP, there were second generation British Indians who were helping in the social media team or the research wing of one party or another. So this was happening. There was a concerted development which has been underway through which parties uh, in India have of course their foreign wings based in the UK. And they, there is a flow of resources, ideas, uh, human power, and so on and so forth. And of course, we need to acknowledge there's a large pro Modi ecosystem that has been created over the years in the UK. Um, to speak more slightly more directly to your question, you know, I remember there was an uh, there was a report which came out last year, which was uh, which was released by the Carnegie Endowment based in the US, which was on the political opinions of the British Indians. And from what I remember of the top of my head, I think one of the findings of that report was that something like 40% of British Indians support the Labour Party and 30% were Tory supporters. Now, on the face of it, this doesn't give us a sense of what might their opinions be on majoritarianism back home. But I think it becomes important, important once you start breaking down this vote support of the two parties. And what the report found, which I found personally quite striking, was that the support of the Labour Party, this 10% lead that the Labour had uh, amongst British Indians, it came predominantly from Muslims and Sikhs. And Hindus over the last decade or two had steadily moved towards the Conservative Party because it, there is a perception that it is somehow more aligned with the interest. You know, uh, We don't know much more than that, but we did have this very interesting data point from that. The report, interestingly, if I remember correctly, said that on the whole, UK-India relations don't matter much to second generation British Indians. That's what they said. And a lot of them, uh, it, the, I think the statistics were something like only 10 to 20% approved of Modi as a leader and a vast number of them disapproved. But I think on the whole, I don't feel very encouraged with the statistic because even if Modi supporters are numerically small, they're far better organized and they're far more vocal. And they can achieve, you know, when they, when they put their minds and efforts to it, they achieve far more than the large number of people who might disapprove of Modi. Uh, and the final point I think worth making, which is the reason for my skepticism about the diaspora playing a role, is that this report also found uh, that the levels of civic engagement amongst British diaspora, Indian British diaspora, is actually quite low. So, you know, when the farmers' protests took place uh, over the last year and a half, we of course saw big demonstrations in London, uh, outside the embassy and uh, other parts of the country. But I think there we need to understand that a lot of the people who came out in support of the farmers, that was grounded in identities linked to being Punjabis and Sikhs, rather than a concern about civil liberties writ large in India, which are going downhill. Uh, maybe this is a pessimistic reading, but I, this, this is based on you know, having my ear to the ground as much as I can, and looking at other scholarship which has been produced on the topic. I, on the whole, think that there are civil society groups trying to do a wonderful job, but on the whole, I don't think they can play a decisive role in moving it one way or another. Um, thank you. Uh, speaking of um, sort of the scholarship around uh, the studies of democracy and authoritarianism, uh, the growth of right wing, the strategies that are being used and the pushback that we uh, see. My final question to both of you um, is, is really to sort of um, have you speak about any thoughts you have on uh, the future directions uh, in your respective sort of um, uh, methods. So say, uh, for Tatiana, if I were to ask you, um, within anthropology and for anthropologists, 
what how do you see uh, sort of the future research on uh, authoritarianism what are the directions you think it should take what are the uh, themes that it could be mindful of do you, do you want to share any thoughts on uh, how as a discipline we study uh, authoritarianism thank you ankita i will not speak of anthropology because i'm not an anthropologist but as a social scientist um I do think some of the most creative and interesting work has been coming from two different fronts. One, at least in Brazil, is the study of social movements, which is a classic area of study for Brazilian sociology and anthropology. But I do think uh, we've been employing new methodologies which have uh, given us interesting insights that we didn't have before. At least for me, this nowadays, the contemporary studies on social movements in Brazil, they seem less formalistic than they used to be in the 70s and the 80s. And I think they reveal more of what is really going on regarding social dynamics and political dynamics in Brazil. I do think it also follows a reorganization of the Brazilian social movements themselves. Right, uh, and that's if we can, if, if I can frame like that, it's one of the the good things that happened in the last four years, be it through the rise on authoritarianism in Brazil or the pandemics. We've seen a reorganization of key social movements that were a bit opaque before, at least during Dilma and Lula. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, the joining of the environmental and the ind indigenous movement in Brazil around issues regarding the Amazon rainforest and indigenous land. I'm thinking also both about the landless workers movement, but also the homeless workers movement. Then we have uh, both the rural and the urban face of the, I think, the most powerful workers movement in Brazil right now. And regarding the homeless urban workers movement, we've seen since last year, one initiative that I think is very powerful and is given, is given rise to a lot of new studies and a new comprehension on how politics is being organized in a grassroots level in Brazil, which is what we call the solidarity kitchens. One of the effects of both Bolsonaro's policies and the pandemic is that Brazil went back to having a hunger problem, right? We didn't have that during Lula was able to take us out of the hunger map during his governments, we went back. So it is very clear that a significant percentage of the Brazilian population, some studies estimate around 30 million people do not have food every day. They're actually in the situation of facing hunger, hungry, hunger every day. And the homeless workers movement has organized what we call solidarity kitchens, in which they not only gather uh, food from different sources, but they cook and distribute every day for anyone who cares to join the line. And in doing so, they are actually transforming themselves into a hub of people who are discontent with the government and that wouldn't meet otherwise. They meet in the lines to get the food. Uh, and a lot of researchers, both anthropologists, but also sociologists and historians have been going to study and to help organize the, this kitchen. So I do think that looking not only, well, as a political scientist, I'm always looking at institutions in the state, but I've been seeing the most interesting work being done by people who are looking at the grassroots. That's one of the, the lines. And I do think inspired a lot by our effort to, to add the, the volume on the radical right in the global south, that interdisciplinary work is one of the keys to think new pathways for research and for understanding. But not only on interdisciplinary work, which is political scientists talking to anthropologists or maybe historians, but actually engaging in focused and serious discussions on how we can, how different perspectives can contribute to the understanding of a single problem. Uh, and that's a line that I think it's very challenging and it's very difficult to cross disciplinary lines. But when we do engage in doing that seriously, and that's mostly of my work with Hosanna, 
I think we get very interesting results. Um, and Amog Sen, uh, a question to you. What is your sort of wish list for uh, the studies of uh, authoritarianism um, uh, from an interdisciplinary perspective? Where do you uh, see sort of direction for future research? I, I think, you know, I totally second uh, Tatiana's point about interdisciplinary research as having the ability to open up re new research questions. And uh, to interdisciplinarity, I would also add being multi method, right? And really letting the method be derived by the question you're asking. Um, you know, I, I've been trained in my doctoral research as a interdisciplinary scholar, but for the kind of questions that I'm interested in, invariably, I tend to read a lot of political science literature for my sins. Uh, and of course, you know, one of the things that I've been worried about, uh, and I'm not the only one who said this, is this obsessive drive towards uh, regression models and quantification and quasi experimental design. You know, my first degree was in economics, so I have a fair bit of understanding, I would, I would like to say, about what econometric models can or cannot do. So I have a lot of respect for that. I have a lot of respect for the kind of questions quantification helps us answer. And of course, we can't throw the baby out of the bathwater. But I'm frustrated repeatedly by the kind of questions that are being asked simply because there is a belief that in political science, the only questions worth asking are the ones which are causal in nature. And there is no you know, appetite for descriptive research as adding anything of value. I can't think of the, you know, all of the texts that I can think of that inspired me as a graduate student to stay on in academia would be all today laughed at as descriptive research. And that is an utter shame. There's no other way to say it. You know, to ask questions such as what makes people more or less likely to be prone to misinformation, that's an interesting causal question and I'm sure it can throw up answers. But, you know, what I've tried to gesture towards what I was saying earlier is that equally important to understand Let's look at the content and the means and the meaning that people associate with what is being uh, spread and the way they're doing it. So much rich material comes out of that. And what else is that if not politics? You know, coming across um, research which would say, you know, we can understand Hindu nationalism if we see where was LK Advani's Rathiyatra in the 90s, statistically significant impact on BJP's vote share. I mean, come on, do we really need? that of research. I, I, I feel quite angry at that and, you know, not to make this a rant. So that is my simple point that to combine interdisciplinarity with multi-method and being letting method be driven by the research question you're asking, not going in with dogma. That would be my big hope. And the final point, if I could add one, would be that, you know, there is also this old chestnut of Indian politics, or so maybe politics in the global south, that there's no ideology. This is a game of uh, loaves and fishes. This is politics for the belly. There's pure interest and there are no ideas. I think the study of authoritarianism and I appreciate the question you were pushing earlier, Tatiana, to respond to. We need to understand the push towards authoritarianism as not simply a simple power grab. There is no way in which you can understand the Modi movement in politics without understanding the ideology of Hindu nationalism. This is not simple, simply being hungry for power, right? So I, I would really want, in the same breath, to understand authoritarianism by taking ideology a bit more seriously and not reducing this to a pure game of interest. Thank you, um, both of you. The floor is now open for um, questions. Uh, in case Indrajit and Shagnik want to share any thoughts while the audience uh, types in, uh, please feel free to put in uh, your questions. Okay. Yes, Indrajit, please go ahead. Can I just, uh, while people are thinking and uh, or, or maybe, you know, just mulling over. Thank you so much, both uh, Tatiana and Amog. I think uh, there's just so much to, uh, you know, think about what you've both said in terms of similarities, but also differences. I think um, it's, uh, and we've had these, you know, India and Brazil are often obvious points of comparison. I suppose some people would also throw in Turkey into the mix, you know. Um, and we do tend, and I'm, I'm responsible for it myself, tend to talk about them in the same breath in, in some ways. But I think it's, while that, I, I do think it's important to talk about the similarities. I think what you've really uh, got us to think about is the, is the variations and the fact that, whether we call it uh, right-wing populism or authoritarianism or use the F word, it doesn't sort of all mean, it, it doesn't all manifest the same way. And the, the, the parts to it are not exactly the same. So I think that's that's been that that that's it's very useful to learn 
uh, about those uh, variations, especially I think, uh, you, you know, uh, Amog, you were talking about, well, the use of Hindu, Hindu nationalism and the use of religion and a certain kind of religion. Um, whereas that's not necessarily what we see, or at least not in the same kind of religious majoritarianism that we see in, in the Brazilian case. And that actually struck me, and, 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 and there is a question, I, I promise, it's not just a comment, there is a question. And, and the question is, uh, you know, I, I, I was just wondering, I mean, obviously there are images of religion that play a role in both contexts. You, you know, there's a certain religious imagination in Brazil, there's a certain religious imagination in India. And I wondered if, uh, you, you know, you could both perhaps um, comment a bit on the specificity of the religious imagination in your respective uh, countries. I think you did mention a bit, uh, you know, about the neo-Pentecostal neo -Pentecostal sort of uh, emergence. And so is that a protest against Catholicism? Is that, uh, is that sort of taking Catholicism into a totally new direction? Uh, I, and I have to confess my utter ignorance of, of the various denominations within uh, in the Brazilian context, um, is that uh, you know how does it how does it sit as it were with the with the you know larger broader if you will religious tradition and likewise uh, Amog I mean I wondered if you could just uh, you know comment on uh, of course that you know the, the BJP talks about Hindu nationalism but um, I think Hinduism just means so many different things uh, and I wondered if you had any thoughts on the sort of Hindu imagination, if you will, that uh, the that you think the BJP under Modi in particular is uh, is is pushing forward. I mean, we we know you know in the past we've talked about or we've been told about the high caste you know convention traditional sort of uh, you know ideas about Hindu Hindu nationalism or, or or you know religious majoritarianism. Did you think it's the same thing that's gone on unchanged, or is there something qualitatively different under the present regime that is you're perhaps making it uh, more popular among the different segments of the population that you were referring to? I, um, I'll stop there, but yeah, that, that was my question directed to both. I can see the Shagnik's hand, uh, hand. So Shagnik, you want to go, I mean, or shall we do this round and come back for your uh, question, whatever? Tatiana and Amog. Whatever's, uh, I mean, I'm okay either way, yeah, whatever you prefer. Yeah. I'd rather answer intricate questions, not just for sake of recognizing the argument in my head. Let's go with this and then uh, Shagni, we can come back to you. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Indrajit. Uh, I do agree with you that we have a tendency of clumping India and Brazil together because they're large democracies with a, a multi-ethnic background and difficult democratic politics. But exploring the differences may tell us a lot about the countries as well, right? Uh, regarding your question of religion in Brazil, I think the new Pentecostal, this new evangelical denomination that has been growing for the last 30 years in the country is an interesting expression on how Brazilian politics has been changing, especially with relation to politics and religion. Why do I say that? Uh, Brazil is considered traditionally to be a Catholic country. Until the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century, if I'm not mistaken, at least 85% of the population would declare itself Catholic. Of course, as an official declaration of faith, which has never stopped the practices of religion by singular groups in Brazil to be very syncretic. So we do have a very strong heritage of African Brazilian religions, and we have had the incidents, and that's where I want to focus on, of the development of this neo-Protestant denominations, which we call in our context, neo-Pentecostal, neo-charismatic, and that do have a counterpart to the, to the North American and the, the expressions in the United States, not only to Baptist churches, but to this very charismatic expression of Christian faith. But that in Brazil is a very recent development and one development that I think marries very well with the rhetorics of Bolsonaro, because they have developed against the background of majoritarian Catholicism. So the most vocal expression of religion nowadays in Brazil, it's not a majoritarian religion. 
right? It's a minoritarian expression. They have been growing in numbers, but this is a recent development. Uh, and they've been growing, especially among the poor and the disenfranchised. So the rhetoric very much matches the idea that they are persecuted because the Catholic Church is dominant in Brazil and they do not have the liberty to express their faith. But they also have mostly a very conservative approach to the reading of the Bible. So they are very literal which is something that the Brazilian Catholic Church has distanced itself from. So nowadays, and this I think could date to the 70s and to the 80s, mostly to the expressions of the theology of liberation, as I told before, but the Catholic Church in Brazil has assumed since the dictatorship uh, openly a, a more progressive, if we can call that, instance toward politics. Uh, regarding the poor, regarding the disenfranchised, regarding the tortured. Um, so it's interesting to think this new Pentecostal or new charismatic movement developing as a more conservative response to what, to what the Catholic Church was doing. And so this is also a rhetoric that matches very well with the idea of the common folk, right? Uh, in quotes on common folk as being those who are left out of Brazilian politics by our ruling elites, which are Catholic. So that's, that's a very interesting mix on it, how it's being defined and arranged. And that's why we see a, such a strong conservative rhetoric in Brazilian authoritarianism today, which is against sexual expressions, which is against women rights, because it's all very connected to a very literal and conservative interpretation of the Bible, which in some sense, not all, of course, we do have conservative Catholics in Brazil, but the Catholic Church had abandoned in the country. And that followed our process of redemocratization in the late 80s and early 90s, which somehow created this tension that is exploding now. And so for me, the most interesting thing, the most interesting part of this process has been happening in the last weeks, which is the new Pentecostals coming very loudly forward against the Catholic Church, which is very new for Brazil, uh, but having governmental support. So it, I don't know if I answered your question, Andrea, just, but just following Amog's <laughs> Uh, inspiration to give you more context on how religion and politics is intervening in Brazil and in Brazilian nationalism nowadays. It does, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you for that prompt, Indrajit. And I do take the point seriously that often differences can be just as illuminating and, you know, often the impulse to make quick comparisons uh, is not always the only way forward. Um, on religion, of course, you know, I'm, of course, uh, thinking back that, you know, someone as foundational as Christoph Jaffelow when he talked about religion in the 90s, the point that he made was that this has very to do with religion, but rather this is an ethnicized identity of being Hindu. Uh, and then, you know, of course, uh, one of the most strongest rebuttals to that argument was by, I think, a scholar Radhika Desai, who said that, you know, Jaffalo systematically underplays the element of religiosity that is inherent in Hindu nationalism. Based on the kind of fieldwork that I've done, so if I talk about the, the context of my own primary research, I feel like I side slightly more with Jafflo's argument. So, you know, a lot of the newer, younger, enterprising folks, you know, the ones who work nine to five jobs in MNC and then tweet about Hindutva in their private time, they conform more to the Jafflo model where there's very little understanding and ascription to relig religious identity in the traditional sense of the term. So there, I, I, I do think that religion in the, in the strictest sense of the term has, has a very little has very little role to play. It's more about an ethnicized nationalistic identity, which of course dovetails with all sorts of religious tropes and cultural practices as it does. But your point on caste is I think far more, um, far more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's far more troubling for me because of course, you know, as scholars who have studied Hindu nationalism, we of course know BJP's identity was that of a Brahmin Vanya party, a party of elite scholarly caste and mercantile caste. And this has been true even now as Gilles Vernier and Christophe Raffalo who studied the composition of the MPs and office bearers in the BGP have shown that 
compositionally, sociologically, they still come from the forward caste. But, you know, I think in recent one or two years, I've, I've had to pause and have to reconsider what scholars such as Badri Narayan have written, that there is an appeal amongst Dalits in particular that Hindutva is developing, that we need to take more seriously. Often this term was thrown around on, around the West Bengal general election, subaltern Hindutva. And I think this was problematic and I by no means want to put this forward as, uh, as I, I, I endorse it in any, any way. It had its fair share of problems. But you know, in a, way, in a recent article, Badi Narayan makes this wonderful uh, point based on years of research now in small town villages in Uttar Pradesh, that the, that the perception that BGP is a Brahmin Banya party just does not exist among the lower caste in Uttar Pradesh, right? This is not a one-off single data point. He has written about this extensively. And he has shown that the way we think about religiosity amongst the lower caste has changed dramatically. So I think this is the reason why I've had to pause. And I think I've had to reconsider that it would be increasingly patronizing on my part as someone who comes from an upper caste background to continue harping on the point that this is false consciousness on their part. BJP is elitist, BJP is Brahminamunya party, and these people don't know who they're voting for. I think it's, it has been a moment for me to pause and consider what is the possibility of upward social mobility that they're envisioning within this movement? This is again, not to go back to the older point of Sanskritization that Srinivas had come up with, but really to pause and simply pass the mic and listen for, for, for a while and really consider what is the appeal that this movement with its religious and ethnic overtones has for these people and what is the religious sensibility at play? That has been my approach. I don't think I've, I have answers there, but I do, feel that that's something I want to do and think about a bit more. Thanks, that, that, that's really helpful. And, and for, for all that I just said about differences between the two, there in fact are lots of you know, points on which both your accounts do seem to converge. You know, there seems to be this pushback against conventional traditional forms of thinking about religion in both contexts, uh, which seem to then coalesce around these new uh, right movements of the right again without meaning to gloss over the differences but I, I, the, the parallels were striking so thank you thank you both so much Shalmik your question hi hi yeah, no, no, no. thank you first of all for your very insightful presentations and it's it's been really fascinating to hear both of you and to see uh, you kind of pack in so much in your comments and reflections so my I have Two questions uh, primarily for Amok. So I really um, appreciated your point about misinformation and the way in which the writing frames misinformation as, you know, we are simply presenting facts and it, this is different than the left kind of preaching from the pulpit and so on. So, um, yeah, so I, I was just wondering, like, you know, because there's some literature on authoritarianism, and I was especially thinking about uh, Lisa Vadim's work on Syria, where she talks in her latest book precisely about this, and she's um, also saying something very intriguing, where she sort of argues that when there is an excess of information out there, then you uh, people tend to select information that aligns with that their thinking. So I was wondering if you saw some, if you see something similar in your um, kind of fieldwork and your uh, analysis of the right wing in India, and also the kind of just a follow up question um, based on kind of your remarks on caste and Hindu nationalism. So I mean, Jafilo's latest book does talk a fair bit about this in Modi's India. He does talk about the OBCs and kind of their enrollment in Bajrangal and so on. And then he is also making a sort of interesting argument about um, how there is a certain kind of economic populism, which has kind of, uh, it has forged this sense of dignity, you know, with the Ujwala scheme and cylinders and so on. So uh, do you think that is something that can explain the kind of lower caste thing? Uh, Dalit and OBC gravitating towards the right wing and uh, yeah so those were my questions and thank you so much again for uh, both your presentations I really enjoyed your um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks Agnik. Um, you know I'm, I'm so glad you bring up Lisa Vadim because uh, as, as a PhD student her book on Syria was quite foundational to me to think about the role that culture plays in an authoritarian setting and I do think the point there uh, does stand you know whether it's these uh, big hoardings that, for instance, she observes in Syria, 
um, and you know the kind of the kind of politics it lends itself to that she talks about. I think the exactly same parallels do exist. So whether you know it's an in-person election campaign where you have these huge cutouts, these huge hoardings, or just endless streams of bunting, which you know don't convince anyone of what policies you stand for, but they create a perception in the mind that this party is dominant. I think what we see playing out on social media with these endless retweets, these endless endless abuses which are hurled. It's not as if they believe that they're changing anyone's minds, but by shouting someone down, they're provoking the perception that we are the dominant ones. And there is, of course, a literature in political science, which I think does have an interesting idea that during election campaigns, when we see this show of strength, where they try to flood your vision in different ways with their message, in, in developing countries, the argument stands that in developing countries, this is also a way of communicating that should we be elected to power, we will also have the organized, organizational capacity to deliver on public goods. I do think more research is needed on this point, whether this is really something that's true, but I think it's an interesting point to consider that organizational prowess in the context of election campaigns, of an election campaign can become a signal of organizational abilities in power. That's something worth considering. And your second point, absolutely. I think, you know, when I read Jafflo's recent book, Modi's India, for me, that was one of the biggest takeaways that this is no longer, he's willing to concede that while the composition of people in power in the BJP has remained within the upper caste, the people calling the shots on the grassroots are now the lumpenized Bajradan girl who of course come from far humbler socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, I think schemes such as Ujwala of course have played a role, but there again, I think we need to balance the focus on discrete public goods which have been provided by the Modi government, which are very important, with also the kind of stuff that I think Badri Narayan was talking about, which was grounded in ideology. I think both play the part and I, I would hate to swing to either extreme. Uh, I think we need to sort of think with them together side by side, uh, but absolutely, I do take that point. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like to thank both <clears throat> Tatiana and uh, Amo. We are very grateful that you uh, took time and it was a absolutely fascinating discussion. It has left uh, all of us with several uh, things to sort of think through and, and read around. Um, but um, I also want to quickly plug our next uh, uh, session, uh, which is on uh, the 4th of uh, November. It's at the same time. And um, <clears throat> we have Abdul Malik Simon, we have uh, Fiona Anciano, and we have Gautam Han. And hopefully we will have a discussion on uh, the city or the urban as a site for uh, the emergence as well as probably the erosion of citizenship uh, claims. So, uh, so looking forward to that, uh, uh, the next session and I invite everyone who's attending this to the next session too. And uh, with that, thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, from all of us, from the entire team and Jindal and York uh, to both uh, Tatiana and Amok. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was an exciting conversation, and I hope this is just the first step for future absolutely. collaborations. I hope so, too. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.